and good morning and happy Saturday again. This is episode three of the Hotel Havoc podcast. My name is, I go by Havoc 6 as my call sign, as many of you already know, but you can call me Ian, that also works. And a little bit about me, for those who have never joined the podcast previously, I am an Army captain. I've been a combat engineer officer for over 10 years, just about going on 15 now. And I've spent a lot of time in different jobs, different roles within the defense community in D.C., a little bit of foreign military sales, a little analyst work, strategic analyst work here and there. So I know a lot about, I know a little about a lot of things, and I'm no expert, no SME, but I like to bring on people who are way smarter than me to come and talk about why they're smarter than me. And with that, I want to take a minute to introduce my guest here. Uh, one you may be familiar with if you've been interested in tra tracking weapons, systems, information in general regarding conflicts around the world. And I'm joined today by Caliber Obscura, which I'll now call you Cali from here on if that works. How are you doing today, man? Yeah, pretty good. Thank you. It's a nice day outside. Yeah, no, that's good. That's that's got to be somewhat rare for the UK, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not as rare as you'd think at this time of year. I'll, I'll leave it like that. <laughs> no, that that make, that makes sense. So this is usually the time of year that I used to travel. I used to go to Ireland every year. So every spring right. or maybe late summer, we go to Ireland, and the weather is usually pretty solid. And I always always enjoyed those trips. Yeah, I, I think it's it, it when it gets like above thirty degrees. That's that's sort of not so common, but. Yeah, sure, right sure. now it's it's about it's about right. This is the most British thing ever. Like you start off, and it's like we start talking about the weather. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Proceed. No, no, I know. I, I had to do it. Just I, I had to roll with it. It's just it's the way. So my my folks, my parents are from from Ireland, and I have a lot of family that are from the UK as well. So it's 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 normal. <laughs> it's what I'm used yeah. to. But again, man, hey, I appreciate you joining. I want to just talk a little bit about anyone who may be not familiar with you, but your self-described bio, basically, you, you, you told us that you're interested in arms research and analysis, and you're an occasional effort, effort poster, which I, I need to ask what an effort poster is, because I don't think I know that one. Well, everyone talks about uh, shit posting. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the opposite of shit posting in my mind is effort posting. So like, I okay. occasionally put effort into the posts. <laughs> uh, that's fair. I actually, I, I actually like that. I might have to, I might have to categorize some of the stuff I post so people are aware. I, I've been, I don't know if you've seen lately, but I've been ranting that sarcasm does not carry well in the uh, in Twitter. It's, it's really, really bad. So <laughs> I might have it, to start. I might have to depart like a little, a little note that this is an effort post or this is a shit post. Yeah, yeah, it, it really doesn't, and particularly when you're dealing with people that maybe don't know you very well or haven't followed right. you for a long time like people that that know my work and that know my opinions will be f fully aware that like fl 80 percent of what i say is probably sarcastic or tinged with sarcasm <laughs> not everyone does yeah. but that, that's the way no. with text isn't it yeah that's the way you gotta do it man that's how we gotta do so you've some of the stuff that you've been kind of interested in focusing on has been like the middle east asia some africa work and of course ukraine you also mentioned that you're self-taught and anti-authoritarian which is obviously a great thing right but beyond that, like, tell me, tell me a little bit, you know, a little bit more about yourself. What, what kind of got you interested in, in all, all of this? Where'd you start? I know you, you know, you've been around since what, at least 2017 on, on this current profile I have here. But mm -hmm. yeah, just give me a little bit more background about you. Yeah, absolutely. So like many other terrible things, it kind of started on Reddit. I was looking on Reddit, and I've, I've said this before, but I was looking on Reddit, like combat footage or serum civil war or something like that. And I was looking at that. And I had time to burn, and I really wanted to be distracted. And I was like, I'm not seeing the content that I want to read. That's not to say there wasn't lots of people doing great work to a certain extent. I just wasn't aware of that. But I, was, I, I didn't see the stuff that I wanted to see. There was a lot of really talented people, even on places like that. So, you know, Hugo, the world's, most, world's best vehicle-borne explosive device I'm butchering it, expert, VBID, you know, he, he started off posting on, on Reddit first. So it's not to say, not to disparage anything there, but I, 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 I saw a gap in what I wanted to read, which was on the one side, you've got very, very dry, analytical, hard to get into, stodgy PDFs. And on the other side, you've got people just posting on social media. Now, look, I, I'm really trying to, post it much, much less it's got a lot worse but social media in general but there's a gap between the two and what i wanted to do was getting get just into writing for people 
a bit like me who wanted to kind of learn things in a in a more narrative format. The, the approach that I take with particularly my public writing is I, I always try and find the more esoteric, I try and find the more interesting, and I try and find that the narrative out of all these things. Now, if, if we're discussing weapons in general, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm obviously from the UK, it's a bit unusual, but I, in a sense, I steeped myself via the internet in what you could call American gun culture for a long, long time. I, I can't tell you exactly how long, but, you know, all of these blogs, forums, enthusiasts, areas, I was just really interested in that. It ticked my boxes for some reason. And yeah, it, it kind of moved on from there. I'm trying to avoid erming, but it moved on from there. I started writing and then I found that there's, there's much, 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 much more here. You've got to learn so much more about the subject matter. Every day I learn more. Every day I realize how little I, le- I know. And over time, I just became interested in, I remember the, the Libyan civil war starting after the Libyan revolution and Syria and all of those associated events, the rise of the, of the Islamic State and the subsequent semi-collapse of the Islamic State, and now obviously Ukraine. So I hate to be a terminal generalist, but I yeah, I'm just interested in all the weapon systems they're using, small to large scale. And I'm also just really interested in some of the dynamics of how some of these groups operate, both, both whether state or non-state, uh, messaging, media operations, all of these things. Now, you know, to be clear, I, I'm not from a military background. I left school without a university degree. I don't have anything. You know, I left school at 18. I work a very different job to this, which I enjoy, but it, it's not, this is not my day job. And yeah, there we are. <laughs> I'm ranting. My apologies. No, 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 that's, that's perfect. I know, no, but that's a hundred percent fair. You know, I, hell man, how many, how many, like, like you pointed out accurately, how many keyboard at, keyboard warriors and experts are out there right now. We went from Ukraine offensive experts to the ZPP, the power plant experts, to now the French riot experts. You know, it's, it's, but I, I will say that I've, I've, I've been following you for a while now, actually. And I, I appreciate your, I appreciate your, your approach to things. It's just straight up. Here's a weapon system. It's interesting that it's in Ukraine. It's interesting that it's in Syria. And your, your blog at uh, caliberobscura.com is the same way. I, I appreciate it. It's very, uh, from what I've seen, it, it seems, it seems well written and it, it doesn't, that you don't speculate, you know, you don't say anything that I, you don't say anything that you wouldn't know. Right. I mean, that's, that's half the battle and that's, uh, that's a good lesson yeah. others could learn, I suppose. One of the main goals was, was with right, that writing was like, Hey, when I, when I find, when it becomes less interesting, I'll stop doing it. You know, I, I stopped writing for probably nigh on two years, then start again. I'm not writing much at the moment. Uh, I, but the most important thing was that was with that. I wanted to just put out as much accurate information as I possibly could. I have biases. We all have biases. I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. But yeah, one thing I'm not going to do is make things up or hype for the sake of nothing and yeah, you, you touched on it, and I was listening to Robert Evans, uh, as of, of Behind the Bastards fame, talking about it just the other day, about it makes it so easy for anyone to put a, put a thought out there. That's a good thing, but the the downside of that is you, you get social media analysts which don't accurately reflect the situation, if I could put that diplomatically. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, that's that's honestly nicer than I would have put it. I think you, I think you nailed that. I am the first to admit. You know, most of us come from a biased background. I'm obviously, you know, I'm obviously biased when it comes to the Ukraine situation. I'm very upfront about that. I don't hide that. Try to, you know, try to maintain an open mind. That's all we can do, and you know, just just approach it from that perspective. But a little off topic before we dive in, because I have to decide how combative I want this to be. <laughs> who, who's, who, who's your team, Premier League? Do you follow oh, the English Premier League? Yep. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, sorry, I didn't catch the last bit. Um, Manchester oh, United. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, there's my man. Hell yeah. Yeah, Love excellent. It. Yeah. Bo- the, the, born and bred, born and raised, man, you fans, so I can walk. So I just had to yeah. clarify before I got to you. <laughs> yeah, it, it, people, people, it's really important to so many people. And, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to say I'm a huge football guy, but like right. when there was the World Cup, you know, when there's, when there's big stuff going on, I'm, I'm interested. And yeah, it, it comes from... It's just always been a tradition, I would say, since day dot. I don't quite know why. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, no, I, I, I'm the same way. I, I, I played for years, but I obviously gravitated yeah. a little bit more to focusing on 
news and boring stuff, but I, I always have to ask because my, my very first trip to the UK was a Man U and Leeds game and no, Man U oh, Liverpool oh, game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, it was great. Yeah. I learned a, I learned a lot of swear words as a five year as a seven year old, I can tell you that much. But anyway, <laughs> I just had to segue real quick to like I said, to see yeah. how combative I wanted to be for the rest of this. So <laughs> uh, but with that, let me let me just so let me just dive in a little bit here. I know you you obviously have a lot of interest and in a lot of like I said, I, I enjoy reading your blog, but I, I kinda wanted to narrow it a little bit. To, to get your thoughts on some things. So it's impossible to talk about any current events right now in the defense or arms weaponry world without bringing up Ukraine, obviously due to its magnitude mm-hmm. and the significance of a, you know, a major land war in Europe. And yeah. I, I kind of wanted to hear your thoughts because we had talked about this previously. I wanted to hear your thoughts on how news media is approaching the war across the world. It's, it's in my it, from my perspective, and I'm sure everyone else's, it's very uneven. It's it's extreme mm-hmm. one way or the other. And I, I just want to pose that question, that very broad question to you, and then we can we can kind of narrow it from there. But yeah, just want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things I try and do is I, I try not to just bash people and I try not to, as we'd say, gas people up too much either. So I'll, I'll take that approach. So what I think is good about how I'm going to talk about Western media in particular in this sense, how that have they have, how they have approached Ukraine is there has been a shift from, you know, oh, we've got this vague, uncertain rebellion from people who speak a different language to the rest of Ukraine and maybe they're oppressed and maybe they do have a point. And, you know, can we really be sure that the, that the Russians are involved? You know, you know, you know. I wasn't intensely following it in, in 2014, 2015, but you can read reporting from then. I've read a lot of reporting from then to try and understand some of the more background here. And I'm not an area expert, so I'm going to pull that out. But you, you did have a lot of that, and Ukrainians complain about that. Now, if I can take one, just say one other thing is, you know, I'm not Ukrainian. Ideally, we'd have, if we're talking about this, we'd have a, a Ukrainian here to, to bring the local perspective. I obviously don't agree with that with, with the ideas though you do do you've been to that on the ground. You can't ever say anything, yada yada yada. I, I think that's a step too far. But you know, this is from a Western perspective. Ideally speaking, I would like to try and center a Ukrainian perspective. Or even as controversial as it may be, if we were talking about what Russian soldiers are experiencing, that Russian perspective. Because we are dealing with people that this is their lives on the la- on the line. This is their value systems, uh, and yeah. Segueing from that, I think one of the things which the Western media hasn't done so well is actually taking into account the existential nature of what this is for Ukraine and the Ukrainian state. There was this assumption that the Ukrainian military would collapse. I, I-, I personally didn't share that assumption. I did think they would eventually fall, and to be honest, I think in a conventional sense, they would have done without the massive material support from the West. I I think there would have been some kind of move in that direction, simply because in a couple of months, they they used all their Soviet artillery ammunition, basically speaking. But I didn't think they would collapse. I didn't think that they were as hopelessly corrupt and riddled with issues. And whereas we can talk about problems within the AFU, I'd I'd be very happy to, as I see them, because that's another thing, I I don't like any anyone being whitewashed or decisions being whitewashed they are frankly much more competent than i think the analyst class the dc class if i can put it this way you know you can say the whitehall class and much of the media class gave them credit for and i think ukrainian society as a whole as a production or you know of hundreds of years and both of the most recent conflict has proven to be more resilient than than people expected now i know that's not a controversial thing to say now But if we look back to maybe December 2021, we had a situation where, and going through into February, we had a situation where the the vibes, particularly with European states, both European media and European special services, if we want to put them that way, was, you know, this this is inevitable, the collapse is going to happen. All of these things. So I I take exception with that. Now, I think they've got better, but what I still take exception with is what they are willing to do to achieve their goals. We simply can't apply Western military or Western civil standards, or as in peacetime Western, to a society that is in effect in in all-out war. I I don't understand why people would, you know, oh, they can't possibly blow up a truck bomb. 
on, on a bridge. Why couldn't they? You know, it, 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 if they didn't do things like that, they would be physically under the boot of a Russian occupation. It's not something which I relish. But, like, guys, stop being surprised. Please stop being surprised. <laughs> you know, I, 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 can't, I can't say anything. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not fighting for them. But their, their mindset is obvious, and I think that sort of please understand the mindset. This is not you and I can talk about this as much as we like and then go back to our our, our comfy houses and our sofas. Right. And But I, I just think that's been a gap. Yeah. Yeah, no no question. <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more on that. I think there are definitely, as we saw, there was plenty of folks that were saying that the capital would fall in two weeks. Not only Russian, but American, English, you know, everyone they were all kind of under that same assumption there has been an, an ongoing and i think i think it's because you know 2014 that obviously was very different that that didn't go <laughs> as that didn't go very well for ukraine overall i mean they obviously fought back they did a lot but a lot happened there <laughs> but the, i think the key lesson that russia didn't apply as well as they did so the <laughs> the army that we're seeing now is completely different than the one we saw back then and i think <laughs> a lot of us assumed it was going to be just like that and it obviously wasn't but yeah uh, yeah i i I think to be fair uh, yeah those of those members of especially western military that had actually trained directly with the ukrainians and had direct contact with them it's maybe especially at the higher levels and I'm, i'm not just talking about you know infantry training i'm talking about experience with with command thinking and some of their planning i think weren't surprised i i think the issue is is that we're talking about a situation where maybe until a couple of weeks into the war people who were talking about ukraine as in in news media were based in russia th- th- this was this was the case you know i i like journalists i help as many journalists as i possibly can because i think accurate information is important but I, I think that I think that was a a important gap. Yeah, I'd be interested in your thoughts. Yeah, no, I, I again, like you're you're saying everything that saying everything that I've already kind of I already kind of agree with, and it kind of ties in to some of the narratives that we kept seeing coming out, and that was the that that what's now become a swear word for me, which is escalation. I'm mm. really, really, really tired of seeing that word because it's just it just the longer the longer the conflict has gone on. Every time escalation is used, it is weakened. And mm. it was the same with Obama's red lines in, was it Libya or Syria? Syria. Syria, or, yeah. Or, yeah. It was the same with when Obama put out the red lines in there and nothing happened after. And, you know, yeah, Russia's been doing and, the exact same thing. And it's, it's the same. And, and, and funnily enough, the reason nothing happened was because a, a deal was made with via right. Russia, with the Assad regime. And, you know, they were very, very scared. You know, Assad and his and his buddies were very, very scared. They were evacuating. They were, they were going to Lebanon. They were they were they were convinced. Now, you know, I think a lot of that has has to be has is down to the the UK House of Commons for giving Obama his excuse. But we we don't need to relitigate that. But I, I think it's that's an interesting point because in Syria and a lot of this was justified. There is easy to it was easy to have grey zones. I'm not talking about those people, but uh, but yeah, it's easy to have. You know, there's bad people on either side. We're not quite sure who we can trust, and we had this whole situation where the Gulf states were involved. We had Russia almost literally dumping its ex- its extremists into Syria to get rid of them, like physically, and it was easy to be murky. So I think Ukraine has been a lot easier for media in general to pass because as much as you want to do verbal gymnastics, NATO expansion, da 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 da, which people try and it usually fails, they invaded. They what they, they said repeatedly they would invade every single one of their stupid acolytes in the media and their ambassadors and even their foreign ministry said they wouldn't invade. And they invaded and it was very, very clear who the aggressor was. And you can try as much as you like to say eight years of bombing in the Donbass. But have you seen Donetsk City? I mean, the Ukrainians get drone footage of it practically every week, just as a just reminder of how close they are. And right. th- th- yes, not to say there hasn't been civ- civ- civilian casualties. The I- I've done work for human rights related organisations. You know, I've, I've worked with Amnesty, for example. Dirty word in Ukraine at the moment. 
and so the sort of human rights part of me says, you know, every life is precious and, and of course. Mor- morally so. I, I 100% course. agree. But the, the excuses don't fly. And I, I think that's been a lot easier for much people. And it, it, it's let the average Western civilian, whether it's in Europe or in the United States or even elsewhere, fairly easily make up their mind. It's not very hard. Uh, whereas in, in Syria, as much as, you know, I'm as, as much of a supporter of uh, liberty for the Syrian people as much as anything else, but the conversation became poison. The situation became poison. It still is. So, yeah, I, I think that made it a lot easier for them. I, I, I do think one of the places where the Western media, but also government is failing is in, I hate the word the global self. I hate the word, I hate using Africa as a continent and saying it's one country. But I, I do think South America, Africa, India, there's been a gap in messaging in, in, on a strategic level. That's not to say that people from these countries all support Russia, but it's allowed that grey zone like we had in Syria in the West, but there for, for Ukraine. And I think that's damaging for everyone, really. So one of the things that you mentioned that was interesting with Obama, mm-hmm. you mentioned that the House of Commons kind of gave him kind of gave him either an out or maybe that wasn't the way you phrased it, but without getting too political, I know we're kind of segueing. I'm, I'm just kind of curious what, what, what you're referencing there, if you don't mind talking about it. Yeah. Well, I, I hate to indulge the sense of British exceptionalism that sometimes exists in the worst parts of the internet on either sides of the aisle, but I mean, sometimes it goes the other way, but yeah, I, what I was referring to there was so they, obviously, David Cameron, along with the French, along with the Americans, wanted to launch a strike against the Assad regime. I'm not, I, I can't remember every detail of it, but essentially he, he put it to a parliamentary vote. And Ed Miliband, who is the, was the then leader of the Labour Party, was mostly expected to support it, as this wasn't a Iraq kind of intervention. But because everyone apparently suffers from terminal Iraq brain, he, the Labour Party voted against him. And because we weren't going to do it, that was kind of gave Obama, who was never very, very keen on it, in my opinion, the rhetorical, you know, our most senior ally isn't very happy with it. Perhaps we can think of a different path. Perhaps I'm misremembering it, but that's, that was back in 2013. Uh, and, and David Cameron, you know, obviously the leader of the, of the Tory party and the Prime Minister at the time, was furious, but the vote was, you know, it was defeated. So there wasn't much that he could do. They voted against missile strikes basically because the uh, because of the Labour Party vote against it. They, it was vetoed. And I think that was that was one of the first nails in the coffin of, shall we say, international solidarity against the use of chemical weapons. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. And I, I was in, I was in Afghanistan, thirteen to fourteen. So if, if it was around that time, which I believe it was, my, my memory is, is bad. <laughs> mm. I don't remember the details, but no, I appreciate that. I just, I wanted to kind of refresh my, my own memory. So I appreciate that. Yeah. So we'll go back. Yeah. We'll, we'll take it back to Ukraine again. We, we kind yeah. of alluded to it very, really, really briefly, but beyond the Kiev will fall in three days to two weeks. What, what other expectations or assumptions do you think that we in the west are simply we're simply we're, we're applying incorrectly to to the war currently what, what are some that you've noticed yourself now, now this is a difficult one as i don't think <clears throat> i don't like to position myself as a subject matter expert in strategic planning or tactics or anything like this i, I don't have experience in that area but i think some people are making are almost making the assumption that the war that the Russians are fighting is the same war that the PLA would would fight, or the same war that the Iranians would fight. And yeah, I, I don't want war with either with either of those states at all myself. But I think people are, in the first sense, people are kind of perhaps fooled by the fact that the PLA has quite a few vestiges of what we could call the, the Soviet system. Soviet style aircraft systems. I mean, they've mainly switched to 155 from 152 now, but you know, a lot of this kind of thing. They're not organized in the same way as the Russians. They're learning lessons the same way as everyone else. So, so I think that's a bad thing to do. And same with the Iranians. I, I think 
I hate to say it, but the Iranians have been very successful over the past even 20 years, growing their influence and their ability to apply direct and indirect pressure to the Gulf states, who, frankly, without particularly the United States, would be almost defenseless, and also directly to the United States and Western allies. And these are two very, very different or three very, very different things. I think any lay person can actually see that. But I think it, it, there's, a, there's an obsession maybe with the, the current thing, the current stuff that's happening. And we did see this, particularly earlier on. I think we've got more balance, but tanks are obsolete. And now aircraft are obsolete. And now attack helicopters are obsolete. And now maybe drones are obsolete because the Bayraktars started getting shot down. And it's like, guys, you're, most of you are trying to be serious analysts. The least you can do, and look, I'm a nobody, but you've got to look at this in, in the broader context. You've got to look at this in, from the data points you're looking at. The fact that N-laws are popping T-72s every single day, this is, say, let's, let's say this is mid-March last year, that's, not a, that, that's because the Russians are using them wrong and not because the entire platform is obsolete. Like, what can do what, what can do a tank's job better than a tank at the moment? You know, the, uh, the M10, not a tank, maybe can do it worse, you know, <laughs> the, the, the whatever. So I think that's one of the, the kind of problems here. There's a lot of lessons to be learned. And I, I took notice of, of your conversation you had on this podcast, I think, recently, that there is an awful lot of things to be learned. But I think social media and the massive amount of footage we're seeing can present a skewed view. And I'm cognizant of that. I'm, I'm one of the people that behind maybe not the most influential, but one of the most influential conflict tracking teams, whatever you want to call it, regarding Ukraine. And I have to be cognizant of the fact that if I'm writing this, what impression am I giving to the people that are listening to me? Because believe it or not, there's a lot of normal people, sorry, normal people, that sounds bad, but a lot of average <laughs> internet users and a lot of nerds and a lot of people that actually are in decision-making places and are policymakers and are all of these things. And I think the social media narrative, tanks are obsolete. Or for as an example, it's being dogged on a lot, but it just gives us bad, bad data. And assumptions are made based on that in the future. And we have, like, like in this country, we've had some of some senior people in the military kind of make comments that look to me as if you must know better. But it sounds like you're basing that off the fact that you saw a load of videos on Telegram of ta of, of tanks getting destroyed or aircraft getting shot down, and saying, "Oh, well, bulk is less relevant now. We need automation." And it's like. Guys, try harder. I mean, there's people getting paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to give you analytical information. Please try a bit harder. That's just me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. 100% right. Welcome. And that's, oh God, that's a huge part of U.S. politics right now, too. There's a, a certain wing of a certain party that is that harps on things like that. They see, you know, a missile strike in downtown Kiev, and, and they're saying that the Patriots are a failure, and we should stop funding Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you know mm -hmm. the drill. And that was that was half the I think that was honestly half the reason why it's been such a slow drip of equipment over time is because there's been the expectations and assumptions that this is going to be a failure. This is going to be a failure. They're not going to be smart enough to use that, which is, which is just insulting. But I've heard that multiple times as if and I think I think Liv, Liv Faust, who I've, I've done interviewed now twice, he, mm -hmm. he made a good point that if we can teach if we can teach a damn near 17 year old kid who just turned 18 how to operate an m1 abrams i'm pretty sure that the ukrainian military which is now battle hardened can figure it out it's not it's not that hard you know and i think you yeah. even referenced the fact that they they've mastered all these complicated and annoyingly complicated soviet machines for years and western equipment's pretty much designed to be relatively easy to, op to operate i mean again enough that an 18 year old kid can figure it out Hell, they put me in charge of things, and I still haven't figured out why. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, and, and it's, I'm it's still going to figure point. out why. It's a good point. Yeah, and, but... and yeah, you're you're right. And I think people kind of look at the Afghanistan and the Iraq experience and have and applied that to to Ukraine. 
and you know, I'm not going to relitigate those conflicts. I think two things I would say is a the Iraqis probably don't get enough credit, and b probably neither do do the Afghans. It is a fact that their yeah. army was built around a certain support infrastructure, and when the rug was pulled out from that support infrastructure, it they they had massive problems. I, I'm not going to relitigate any aspect of it, but this sure. match is obvious, and so people have been traumatized by that by the failure, quote unquote, of these experiences and had applied that going forward and kind of assume. Now, the, the very last thing I want to do is say, oh, just because they're from a different background, they're not capable of doing X. I, I, I hate that, that kind of way of thinking. But there have been assumptions made that almost we didn't want to, we almost didn't, we're a bit scared of, of almost of winning. I, yeah. I do not, I, I've seen people say that on the internet and I take exception to it because I don't think President Biden sits there thinking he doesn't really want the Ukrainians to win. I, I think that's nonsensical. What I think had happened, there's been a kind of black cloud over policymaking, which made this assumption that, that you know, we're going to get outwitted by a more nimble en- enemy and, and, and uh, we, we can't possibly win. And I think I have very little positive to say about Boris Johnson, but one of the few things he did do is repeatedly say these people can win over and over and over and eventually people start going well you know maybe the russians aren't this this special animal which we can't touch you know uh, maybe we can cause real damage to them i hate to sound cold and clinical here but that that's that's the fact in my opinion no yeah no you're i think i think 20 years i think 20 years of coin you know counterinsurgency really really tweaked our mindset because we went from desert storm which was i wouldn't even consider iraq even though it was the what the fifth or sixth largest army in the mm-hmm. world at the time i still wouldn't consider them a near peer i mean we we had massive massive advantage over them we had a, a huge alliance network like it was they were never mm-hmm. gonna they were never gonna win that conflict it's just the reality of it but it does seem like 20 years of coin has almost poisoned some of the mindsets that like you said now we're facing what would be considered a near peer. If you want to be super general, let's just let's just go back to to February or let's go back to <laughs> earlier 2022 and say that Russia's a peer, which I don't think is the case at all, not even close. But let's just say that they are. It does seem like we're we're so far away from you know the Cold War where we were gearing up for peer to peer and we were ready mm-hmm. for it, and now that we're we're tiptoeing back to this Cold War sort of kind of style world that we're living in now where there's some multipolarity to an extent i i like me personally i think that we've made this war go on way way longer way longer than it should have i if you if it had been me i would have said that you know like you said you kind of hinted at if you make the costs incalculable for the enemy right up front it, it lessens their ability one to continue the conflict but also might alter their decision making it doesn't seem i mean honestly the way Unless if Russian media is a good, a good marker to tell what their mindset is, I'm not even oh. sure if it would have stopped them if we had wrecked their stuff within the first few weeks. I don't know. They just seem so. I mean, obviously they're in a revisionist period of their history right now. They're trying to. Mm-hmm. I think they're truly trying to revive the Soviet Empire and it's all its glory. Asterisk, big asterisk as far as glory goes for that. Yeah. A little bit of. I think. I think we just need to take our take our balls out of our purse to be honest with you and. Except the fact that we either choose to fight or we need to we need to accept that we won't have the power we had before. And frankly, you know, we give that up. That's fair to an extent, but who else will pick up the mantle? And the options yeah. are bad. Both yeah, absolutely, are bad. absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And it, it's a very difficult question. I I I don't enjoy it when people make assumptions based on Russian media as to their mindset because. Right. Different sections of Russian media speak to different people. And, and frankly, if you're looking at their flagship note news programs and their flagship presenters, they're talking to one man, and that's VVP himself. And they're talking to the czar, and they have a slant to take. But I, I don't think we can assume that they're a monolith. And I think this is one of the things that confuses me. If you want to make a coherent policy argument, and, and some people do, that we should abandon them and we should, I'm talking about the Ukrainians, and I'm using emotional terms because I am emotionally invested, but we should abandon them. You can make that argument. I might not respect you whatsoever for making it, but you can make it. But 
what you have to accept is what comes with that. And the United States, I'm talking from a United States perspective here, and as per, as, as per someone who, and as a country that has benefited fairly massively from a, a Western-centric viewpoint, is that if you want to hand the reins of international bodies to a, a foreign power, which some people would seem to be very, very keen to do, it, you're not going to just then live in splendid isolation. That, that's not the way it works. It, it, they will, and, and I, it, what confuses me is this sort of expectation from some people that, oh, they didn't really want to do this, or they, they just want to be left alone, or, and, it, and I don't know. I, I, there's, a, there's always varying opinions on this, but no, they do hate you. They, they don't, this is, none of this is, this, all of this is cynical. And I was talking to someone the other day and I was, I was making the point that, in my opinion, I'm not a Russia expert, but in Russia, there's a reason that Putin thinks that the CIA is, has, a, has a PlayStation 3 controller like they have in the submarine controlling Zelensky. Because in, in Russia, they don't have the concept of, of, of or, or I should say in these levels of the Russian state, they don't have the concept of genuine populist or genuine grassroots support and and so when they roll into an occupied town and there's people putting up posters or they're or they're uh, putting a few rounds into the back of some russian soldier's head they'll arrest the mayor and and demand that he stops it and there's this assumption there is always a centralized control they they did this in georgia as well and they and so much of their propaganda actually seems to be through this viewpoint that no we really know the truth that, that really the masters in, in DC and in and in Berlin and, and and in and in London are are really doing this, and there doesn't <laughs> seem to point. be an actual understanding that no no the, no 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 that this is real, and I th- I think and I think they get an inkling, and this is why you have these supposedly I don't read a lot of Russian media, but you get these supposedly sensible Russian papers like Commerçant or whatever, and they'll run articles saying. Western commentators are seeing through the fake feeling. And, and the basis of this will be three comments on a Daily Mail article in the UK or whatever in the United States, because the whole point is to show people, look, everything's fake. Nothing's real. Weaponized unreality is the term. And I, I think it's a good term that this is all just stage managed because to a certain degree, that's how it is in Russia, and it has been for a long, long time. No, I don't want to deprive Russians of agency. There's a lot, a lot, there's a lot going on there. Of course. But that is how it is at the highest echelons of the state. In that, that's the thinking, in my opinion. Yeah. No, the autonomy thing is definitely, is definitely a thing. And you're right. I, I, I believe, I agree with you that their perspective is very different. Like, the, like I read an interesting article, you know, the, the Russian people are used to their media lying to them. and we sh- we are too to an extent, right? I mean, we yeah. we see things on <laughs> yeah. CNN or BBC. We're like, okay, sure, the truth is somewhere in the middle, but obviously the extent is far different in that country, right? And <clears throat> when you see the when I see the arguments, and one of the things that triggers triggers me, I hate to use that term, but it really bothers me is when they they push the narrative that the West is pushing Ukraine to fight to the last Ukrainian, and I and I've I've talked told people this, like I've heard this kind, I've heard this from Americans, like just down the street. And I and I'm, I told them like you, you can't Ukraine would not be able to be surviving this long and fighting this long if the people themselves were not in the fight. Like they're not they're not going to the front lines because Biden or anyone else is telling them to. They're not doing that. They're doing it because they one they want to and two it's an existential threat for them. That whole narrative to me is just the most it's the most ridiculous one. And it's again it's insulting. It's, it's it's implying that they can't think for themselves. They can't operate for themselves and we've seen that I, I think it came out a couple like a month or two ago that ukrainian defense their defense their intelligence is not telling us everything that they're doing nor should they as far as i'm concerned i think they should they should be able to run their wars as they see and as we saw with the intelligent intelligence leaks out of the out of, out of the u.s with that that national guard kit it's hard to blame them i, I think that's 100 percent fair but I'm with you, man. They have autonomy. It's pretty clear they do, because if they didn't, this fight, this fight would be over already. They wouldn't have their hearts in it, and they, they very obviously do. Yeah, I, I think they're just. It's 
it's interesting to me that we've gone quite a long time in the West, quote unquote, and I think Ukraine sees itself as part of the West, so I, I don't want to malign that. But we've seen ourselves, oh, we, we've been, we, we have no real genuine national threat of the kind which they have in Ukraine. And I, I, I've, I've heard it less so in this country. And I, I think part of that is because we're physically closer. And we have, there's, there's Ukraine, I, I'm not going to say there's Ukrainians everywhere, but there's a lot of Ukrainians here. We, we see them often. There's almost, there is, there is somewhat of an unfortunate and fortunate background in this country of people talk about, you know, Battle of Britain, the Blitz spirit, etc. But what the positive thing is, is that people are people saw that in Ukraine and have gone and have latched onto it. I haven't seen that dropping off. It is, but but we are very lucky where we haven't had that kind of existential threat. And when people say things like that, I think, well, I say, well, if they were coming to your house and they were going to destroy your house with a tank, what would you do? Oh, well, I would do something to stop them. And maybe I wouldn't be fighting. I might not be picking up a gun but I would be doing something to stop them in, in, in any way that I can. Well, why do you think Ukrainians are, are doing, doing that? You know, it, it's, and I know Americans get a little bit sensitive about this, but it's a, sure. it, it's, it's, to be honest, it's the product of being the head of an, of an empire, of, of being a colonialist mindset. You know, that these people actually don't, they're not really the same people as everyone else because, well, we have that because, we're the imperial masters, and I say that as as the full legacy of of the oh, British course, Empire course. as well. But it is it is current. The, the American Empire is lucky, and I think it's just very very easy for for people who perhaps take on the mantle of neutrality to go. Oh well, they're being pushed into it, and it doesn't stand up to reasoning at all. It, it really doesn't. But it's easy. It's easy to just think that and. Yeah. It, people are uncomfortable, and I think this leads on to to, to the disinformation kind of thing. But people are uncomfortable with with things being complicated. They would prefer a a grand narrative, and and if the grand narrative perhaps is that well, really, Sneaky Joe and 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 Boris Johnson and and Macron are are forcing the Ukrainians into a fight they didn't want, because that makes me feel better about the fact that actually. I'd rather just let them do it, then that's what you'll choose. It, it's not a difficult concept, really. Yeah, yeah. And you, you make an interesting point about the, like, historically for the US, you know, even both world wars, it was a very similar narrative. It was far away. Like, we're, we're, we've we been geographically blessed to be sandwiched between the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic, and then Canada and Mexico, you know? And in both world wars, those conflicts were very, very far away. And the the idea of getting involved in them, and you can see even some some old photos of posters from the time. They're very similar narratives. They they're very very close. And like World War One, sometimes I'm still surprised. Like I'm still surprised that we joined in. I'm glad we did. I think it was the right thing to do to an extent, but that's a whole other thing. But and then yeah, World War yeah, Two, we got, yeah. And then World War Two, we got dragged in kind of against our will. That we got some heavy motivation there. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, and, yeah. and, and, you know, I, I would be the first to credit the United States with that. I, I think it, it's an example of how the United States isn't just, it has, has a lot of the negative characteristics of, of an empire. Absolutely. But it does have, uh, I think that aspect of it has, does, gen, has done genuine good. And this is the, this is the issue. You run into this logic and then you see these absolute morons of mine. Particularly online, you know, I, I, in real life, people don't because, you know, if if Aaron Marte said, if I'm pronouncing it right, stood up in the street in New York and said the things he likes to say on the internet, the Ukrainians would would punch him and he would stop. <laughs> but it's easy, oh, yeah. it's easy to say, it's easy to say it here. I, I say things, you know, everyone says things on the internet they wouldn't. But you you can apply that lo- logic to the second world, and and people start saying, well, actually, yeah, maybe maybe it was wrong, and maybe we should. Have, if Hitler had Europe, he could have come to a deal with 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 the Brits, and maybe we could have partitioned, and maybe and that is where the logic leads. But then most people have the conscience to go. Perhaps you know my logic chain running me to supporting the Nazis taking over Europe is is not such a cool thing, and I should rethink my 
<laughs> my moral logic here. But you, you that's just so. we, we, I'm yeah, digressing. So. I'm digressing. No, I, yeah, no. I, honestly, that's like a whole other conversation, man. I could talk all day about you know the the downfall. That's actually an interesting topic. We could talk about the downfalls of uni, unipolarity hmm. because there are downfalls to that, and some of our worst worst instincts can come out when we when we aren't challenged mm-hmm. and anyway that's that's a whole other conversation so i, well, I won't go down that path but i am <laughs> moving on note. yeah because that would actually be a really interesting chat so i might i might take a note for the future i kind of wanted to move into some of like the disinformation ops and i know neither of us are experts so again i'm just i'm just kind of looking for your your thoughts and your input but you know the tour obviously russia and china are have been notorious for years for operating bot farms and a lot of people will question their existence and whether it's real or fake. I, I'm i not personally entertaining the, the, the idea that it's fake. I 100% believe it's real because we've seen them and we've seen evidence of them. But one of the one of the most interesting things that's happened from this war was the rise of like an organic, I'll call it an organization. It's not an organization per se, but like you got NAFO, the North Atlantic mm-hmm. Fellow Organization, right? <laughs> yeah, and yeah. basically... Basically, what they've been doing, and I've been, I've been obviously, I know a ton of them, but they were combating disinformation via memes and and shit posting, and obviously very intelligent arguments as well. But as far as I know, there had never been anything remotely like that where these and I, the the both, all of our government, both our governments have tried to combat this. I know mm. the the military, the U.S. military, operated a a Twitter account that was set up to combat disinformation from ISIS. And to try to stop recruiting from ISIS, and it was a complete mess. It was horrible. Like, and I think they would admit that. Like, they they tried to do it through memes, and it was just it was so bad, dude. It was just so bad. I kind of I need to write them and see if they'd hire me just to do that because I feel like I do a better job. But it, it but it is interesting though. So you have like you have these people with with dog avatars pop up and just completely derail a lot of the information ops coming out of Russia. And I'm just kind of curious, like without, without diving into, you know, too much about either, but what's your, mm. what's your take on that? I mean, I think it's, I just think it's fascinating personally. Yeah. I, I mean, it is, is fascinating. I think firstly to say is, you know, a lot of my experience and viewpoint frankly comes back to Syria. And one of the things the Syrians never really had, you know, in a large sense was English language people fighting on their behalf against some of these narratives. Now, I'm not going to take a position on this particular aspect or that particular aspect, but that, they never had that. So when you have people who, let's be charitable and say, may not be paid agents, but are certainly, let's say, Russian viewpoint enjoyers, putting out this stuff, there wasn't really many people to speak for the people that were getting barrel bombed or that were getting gassed or that were getting buried in mass graves. I won't go on about it, but that, that didn't exist. Now, in Ukraine, uh, it's interesting how NAFO, as it were, it was a, a essentially a, a Western creation of extremely online people. It's, it's good to see that, that, to some extent, Ukrainians have, have adopted it and taken on part of it as well. That, that's great in my opinion. But also, we have this thing where you have what like, we could call the liberal, the liberal wine mums, you know, the people that aren't super online, but perhaps are, don't like what the Russians are doing. And they've sort of taken up with this. And um, it's not just a group of super online nerds. It's frankly, because, you know, I, I count myself in that. But it's <laughs> Me too. It, 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 it's normal. It, 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 it's people that don't spend all their time on the internet. But one thing they do enjoy doing is is posting memes and, and having a little doc and all of these things. Now, look, all power to them. I it, it, it's a, it's a really interesting topic. Now, I would like to say that I know that in like some of the Baltic states, there has been that they were doing some of these things before perhaps English speaking audiences were. And I, I think some of that comes down to, frankly, superior literacy or media literacy and understanding of what, of what the, uh, the Russian uh, threat is. But I, I think it's really interesting. And we had this situation where for certainly a few months, Russians were 
all the pro-Russian accounts were trying to do the same thing and they were making little dog pictures and, and, and trying to do the same, but on their side, and it, it kind of fell flat because you just don't have this critical mass of supporters. All of these things, it comes down to actually what are the IRL effects on it. Now, I, I can't, I don't think we can quantify them, but I do think that what people like NAFO are doing, A, they are raising millions of dollars overall for Ukrainians, for food, for water, for medical supplies, for drones, for all of these things. And, and they are acting as a community that can boost those, those local initiatives. And they're also making it less feasible to perhaps change the, the area of what is acceptable to say and what is not acceptable to say politically. And if every time you try and introduce the idea that you know, perhaps the Russians will vote, you have you have a torrent of people essentially abusing you. It's just less. It's just less <laughs> likely to happen. You know, and uh, 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 it's funny. You have to laugh. It's funny. It's quite enjoyable. What I think the real world effect has been positive. I, I what I take discomfort in, frankly, is people thinking that well because they've got this profile picture and they regard themselves as a certain community that they are going to go out and actually harass and actually have purity competitions and and take joy in in human suffering that's something i i am very uncomfortable with i've seen massive amounts of graphic graphic imagery over time and if you are ukrainian i cannot blame you for laughing at at some of these things but if you're you are sitting on your sofa in the west you you maybe should be looking at how am I looking at these things, and is that a healthy way to be looking at life in general? Because it does it does bleed it over, and you will start having your your opinions will perhaps be unhealthy. I'm trying to balance this as much as possible in my language, okay. uh, but but I, I think that the the movement as a whole is a very good thing. The only things I am uncomfortable with is is perhaps glorying in things which I don't think anyone should be glorying in myself. That, that's my opinion. Believe it or not, I am anti-war. <laughs> I, I don't think I don't think anyone who's seen it thinks it's a good thing. Uh, I think if you're Ukrainian, you have a license. You know, if you're Syrian, you have license. If you're Georgian, you know. But I think that if you are only very uh, lightly connected to these things, you have to be careful with how with how your mor- morality is perhaps being modified by group by groupthink. But yeah. I actually think overall, it's a very, very good thing. Yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, like I, you know, my perspective is is grim, I suppose. Like I, you know, I spent time in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. I had different backgrounds or different experiences in all three. Some were like one was a lot less violent and the other one was a little bit more violent. All all was smooth. But, but you know, when I, like me personally, when I see an army like the Russian army, and again, this is just my two set. This is my opinion. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing at all. But like me personally, I'm, I'm probably dead inside. <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing shocks me anymore. But you know, when you see an army like Russia like, move into Buka and they move and they do horrible things there, or the 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 POW video that where they castrated that one POW and they they do these things that are almost doctrine. I think that it's easy to yeah. see why people who are already passionate about Ukraine, you know, defending itself and, and, and mm. just seeing that I, I get why people, I get why people are, why they are glorifying, or I guess why they're celebrating dead conscripts on the front line. Yeah. To, yeah, to, uh, 100%, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah and, and again, like, I'm not, I'm not saying you're wrong at all. I, to, to clarify, you're right. There, there is, there's a line where sometimes I'm like, I don't know, man, I, I, I tell a tough line because some of these guys on, on the Russian side, they don't want to be there. They they are one hundred percent forced to be there. I, th- that's the truth. There are some that don't want to be there, and there are some mm-hmm. that don't want to be there that will die. That mm-hmm. that sucks. And then the flip side is there are enough that want to be there and want to do horrible things that their tank blowing up on the front line is a good thing. And I'm glad it's happening from that perspective. Your own way, your view of the world is is tweaked a little bit when you see these things every day, and it's good to be aware of them because. Frankly, the world is is not a nice place, and God forbid this comes this comes home for you. I imagine you know your perspective would be very, very, very different. You know, if it was your family that was in those videos, I imagine your perspective would be very different 
So I, yeah. but again, I, I'm like in that middle ground. Like I agree with you 100. percent We should be extremely careful of how blasé we get about it. There should be empathy for the sake of human life. At the same time, I understand, like you said, like Ukrainians, those in the Baltics whose lives are very much at stake potentially. They huh. they have every right to hell hellfire and brimstone all damn day. And frankly, like I think anyone else, if that's your choice, you do you. That's fine. But I'm with you. Yeah, it, yeah, it is. I, a, it is. Yeah, yeah. I, I just would say be aware of how looking at all these things all day, what what it will do to your to your psyche, because you you aren't special. You know, some people are, are, are special, but you aren't special, and you have. Yeah, the, the absolute last thing I want to do ever is to tone police the people that are in this conflict, you know. Uh, but this this weirds me out. Now, probably some people are going to hear this and be like, oh, this, this, this limey is saying this stuff. He doesn't know anything. <laughs> it's, it's fine. You know, who cares? But you have these people saying, well, like, you know, I would have supported Ukraine, but I saw how all these people were celebrating a, 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 a guy dying and well, that just morally offended me so much. And, and these people saying it are supposed to be hardcore goons. They, they you know, they're ready for the, they're ready for the civil war. Yeah, whatever. I, I, I'm yeah. generalizing, but it's like, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. If, if you, if you were posting hundreds of memes about Boogaloo a couple of years ago, oh god, you, you, the, the concept of people dying doesn't bother you. It's just you're providing your, yourself an excuse to to accept authoritarianism. I, that, that, that's the best fact of it. Now, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Ukrainians, and look, I think it's really interesting because maybe some Westerners are understanding radicalization doesn't just happen to people who are a different skin color or religion to you. You know, it, it's not an ISIS thing. It, it's the fact that you are affected by the things that you see. And that's how you get into a certain mindset. You know, I'm not going to litigate that. But it just astounds, it, 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 A, it astounds me that people sitting in on their sofas can so obviously enjoy suffering. And B, right. it astounds me that people that pre- should know better pretend that it bothers them when it does. I don't think right. that. I, I, yeah. And, and the third thing that also blows my mind is that you can't read Russian. Now, I, I can't say that I'm like a Russian speaker, but you can go on to Russian Telegram. You go on to the, this, it's one click, link click away, and there's hundreds of Russians taking joy in exactly the same way, and Westerns, actually, in, in Ukrainians dying. It's just because of the fact it's in English language on a social media website doesn't make you a special snowflake. You're just following different people. Like, it, it, it's ridiculous to me. But yeah, that, that's a whole other conversation. But yeah, NATO in general, I think it's been a good thing. It's a thing which the Syrians didn't have. And I think they're continuing to do good work. And we, we saw the same thing with, say, Javelin. That's been an amazing thing. I've been yep. really, really heartened by the fact that so many people in, in Europe and the United States have been so supportive of, of Ukrainians. You know, the cynical part of me would say it's ethnic. Uh, compared to some other conflicts, maybe, maybe not. I, I wouldn't like to put that on anyone personally, but that, that's just yeah. yeah it, we, it's a we, really we, complicated we topic. About that. Yeah, we talked about that. We talked about that in the previous episode a little bit, and you're not wrong though. I mean, but there's a, like there's context. It, obviously, it's easier to identify with people who may speak the same language. And frankly, let's be honest, it is easier if they look like you. It is. That's just the reality. That's a, it's a normal human thing. There's that is a bias that is built. I think it's built in. I don't think we can. We can say that doesn't exist because it's not true. I, I think that every everyone would, every study would tell you that's not that's not true. But you know, I think I think proximity helped a lot. You know, again, like a major like a land war in Europe with a nuclear power is a little bit different than a civil war in Libya or Syria. And I think that I think I think you're right. I think that's why. I think there's just an element of that there, which is a shame because we should have equal empathy for every you know everyone. And I hope that I hope that you know when this war ends that they there is a continued there's a continued bountiful amount of empathy towards god forbid whatever else happens next and obviously a lot of people are charged up about china and taiwan i don't think that's going to be an issue but there are hundreds of other smaller conflicts all around the world you know there's you know wagner and some of those groups in africa are causing trouble in sudan i believe right it's where sudan's where all that stuff was going down recently i haven't really been keeping track again because i'm biased that's the thing i've been so i 
I get tunnel vision and I haven't even really been keeping up with Africa, but it's just as important, you know, and that's, that's a problem. Yeah. And, and no one, no one's to blame for having limited bandwidth. Right. That's no one's fault. But I, I think the most important thing for anyone is, is self-awareness of how you're approaching things and being cognizant of that. And, and I, I try to be, I fail often, but, but that, that's the approach that I, I, I take with it. And I, I just, People will say to me, or, or they send me a message, well, you used to be so unbiased. What happened to the old you? And it's like, well, you just didn't notice because my biases happen to conform with yours. And, you know, I, I try not to let it enter my analysis. Right. But it does. It colors it. It colors everything. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. 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 Well, no, I, I appreciate that. Like, like I said, I, I'm a, I'm a fan of NAFO. I'm a fan of what they've done to combat disinformation, mostly because we suck at it from an Absolutely. organizational perspective. So, but yeah, again, agreed, you know, we should, we should keep perspective. That's kind of my final thoughts on that. We'll, we'll keep perspective yeah. and, and uh, try to retain our humanity as best we possibly can. <laughs> yeah, even, though I feel like it's, even though I feel like it's a losing battle right now. So let's move on then. You've been, your, your account is heavy on like weaponry and systems and kind of seeing some of the loadouts that we've been seeing running around the battlefield. What's, I don't know, give me kind of your general general quote-unquote take on things on the ground in ukraine right now or is there anything that's sticking out to you one as a surprise that maybe just you didn't expect lately or you know anything that you think that is needed to change the conflict kind of give me your 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 big picture perspective this is a really really complicated topic yep <laughs> and the, the, the first thing i'd like to say is that i am not an authority i have instincts which are sometimes correct sometimes they're wrong i have you know, identification and monkey brain pattern matching ability, which <laughs> works well. But yeah, so the first thing is, it, it kind of casts slightly back is that the war that we are seeing in footage is not necessarily the same war that is happening on the ground. Not that, not that it's, it's a different war, but it's a, we're seeing different aspects of it. So I am lucky in the sense that I can sometimes benefit from sources which are completely open and you are aware of things which maybe don't entirely run counter to the prevailing narrative, but they're certainly not the same. And people have this thing where if I don't see it, I, I can't believe it. And I think that's completely legitimate. But there's a lot of things we don't see. And there's also a lot of things we don't see because we are English speaking people. And you don't have to be English, so you don't have to be Ukrainian to follow Ukrainian media, and you don't have to be Russian to follow Russian media. Google Translate is like one of the most useful things ever. But there's all sorts of comments and criticism and debates happening on both of those sides, which we don't see. So I'm, I'm, the reason I'm saying that is because I want to contextualize the things that I'm, that I'm saying carefully, and I, I think I would be a lazy analyst, quote unquote, if I if I if I wasn't doing that. So, yeah, so, so the situation in the ground, on the ground in Ukraine right now is obviously it, it's, it's brutal fighting. It's obviously difficult for everyone. I, I don't think anyone's going to argue with that. I think that we haven't seen the final evolution of what the Ukrainians are really planning to do in an offensive manner this year by any means. I, I, I just struggle to think that, oh, they're going to be attacking in in. in Zaporizhia, they're going to be attacking in Bakhmut, and that, that's going to be that. And, and as an example, we've seen all this thing, all this stuff happening over the river in Kherson, which is kind of flying under the radar. But if you are a, if you're a consumer of, of Russian channels, then you can see that certainly there's things that are happening there, and the, and the Ukrainians are putting a lot of effort. Let's put it that way. And there are forces that are being moved there, which would indicate they're taking this seriously. Now, when it comes to systems, I think actually it really harks back to the previous one of your previous episodes about the FPV drones. We're just seeing them more and more and more, and we're seeing them on both sides, don't get me wrong, but the Ukrainians are innovating through it. They're extending range, they're extending capability, they're, they're improving everything about it. And I'm not one of these people that says it's a game changer, and I think we are, have a danger of learning the last war's lessons. It by 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 overly focusing on that, but those are those are becoming more and more important. 
Uh, I think I think on the Russian side, we've seen the Lancet launching munitions. I don't think anyone could say they're not effective. They have weaknesses. The Ukrainians are taking advantage of those weaknesses. But I think the drones are tremendously important. I think another thing is speaking as a as a non military person, the visual evidence that we have of Ukrainian deep fires is is impressive. They're really doing well with that. They, I, I think, the, the Russians are defending very, very hard, but they'd be defending even harder if they weren't losing quite so much ammo and artillery and all of this important command and control infrastructure to Excalibur, to Storm Shadow, to other systems which aren't quite so public. So I, I think that's really important. I think it's a bad idea to focus on one particular weapon system, but I think the ability to disrupt those really important spots is is is, is very significant, if, if I can put it that way. We've seen really good reporting on this from some of some from some parties, like we've seen what Rusi did recently about the, how the Russians have adapted, and I, I endorse that almost completely wholeheartedly, just from my limited experience. They've been on the ground, and I, I think we're almost talking about two different strands of the of the Russian military. One of which is they, they are a learning organization. They are an improving organization as much as we would absolutely hate to admit it and we would wish they never learned anything at all. But they also have this constant, constant problem with getting what's essentially low train barely trained guys, throwing them in the, into combat and stupid things happening over and over. And you know, I'm I'm not a tactics guy. But we have seen that over and over. And that is one of the things which Ukrainians are they're certainly having to, to dig deep. Don't get me wrong, but they still have the initiative, in my opinion, in that area. And I, I think that's really, really been important. But yeah, no, I'd be interested as to your questions about specific systems and what we've seen and what works and what doesn't work. And I can just give you my opinion or my from my experience or my viewpoints. Yeah, yeah no, anything particular. For sure. Yeah, no, I mean, God, I could talk, I could, that's another thing I could talk all day about, but real quick, it is, you're right about the learning, like, it is silly to think that neither side is learning lessons, which I think I mentioned in the last episode I did too, but I was, I was shocked, though, because last year, I remember seeing, and I think I, I think I, I said something about it on Twitter, but I saw a Russian soldier that was, he, he had died, and his tourniquet was zip tied to his chest. Yeah. And I was like, wait, what? Why? Why would you do that? Like that's, that's insane. That's ridiculous. And then last, actually, this past week, I saw it again. It was he was alive, but his tourniquet. Actually, no, he may have been, he may have been he may have been dead, but his tourniquet was zip tied to his chest again. And I was like, that is like, I I cannot fathom. Well, I can't fathom. Let's just be real. But mm. like from a U.S. forces perspective, that is something that is just like that is a squad level task. That is something that your squad leader walks you through check your kit, make sure you're squared away, make sure everything is there. Like that is something that just shocked me. And then we saw another video of a tank. It looked like a T-72 or something. Just roll over eight to 10 anti-tank mines that were kind of in the middle of the road, kind of open, bluntly open. And they just kind of rolled over them. And and like, yeah, and like that itself, someone made a good point that like the visibility may have been severely restricted because they were under attack by drones. So maybe they had the hatches, but whatever. I, I won't, I don't know. I wasn't in that tank, so I can't speak. But what did stand out was what happened after when they, that most of the crew survived lucky for them. They got out and they just kind of ambled around. They, they didn't like, they didn't try to secure anything from the tank. It didn't look like they just kind of walked around it, sat with their hands on their hips and just stared at it for a while. And like that, yeah. that's like a small, that's like a small indicator of the level of training for me, because if I was their platoon leader or commander, we have certain, we have certain, you know, TTPs and things that we need to follow when, when you're under fire and standing around the object, in this case, a tank that just got hit by mines and is now a sitting target is usually frowned upon. There's, there's learning, but at the same time, I don't think that they have the intellectual infrastructure at this time to truly learn in a way that's going to affect them from like a, from like a tactical level, because they don't operate NCOs the way the UK or the U S or French or German military does. You know, yeah. we don't have, yeah. they don't have those low level decision makers that win wars. I mean, officers like myself, will a lot of us will talk all day long about how great officers are, but let's be real. The NCOs are going to win the wars. 
And uh, it's just uh, until they change that, it's they're never going to be on par. They just they never will be. They can throw bodies at the wall all they want. That's that's my take. But the Storm Shadow, what do you know about the Storm Shadow? I mean, it seems to be doing it seems to be doing fantastic work. And I wish I wish they'd had it a year ago. But everything that I'm seeing shows it doing the Lord's work, so to speak. Oh, I mean, I I, I would say that literally physically. I, I think that. It's a really, obviously, a very, very capable system. I think that online we disparage sometimes Western weapon systems because, but diplomatically, we don't hype them maybe in the same way that the Russians are very, very good at doing. And it's obviously a very, very effective system. And, and the thing that blows my mind is that this thing was being developed in the 90s and its heritage yeah. goes back before that. This is not, you know, this is sort of the iPhone 5, to put it in that sense. It is, it is not super new technology. There's replacements being developed literally as we speak. And that it's, it's a very good system. I, I honestly don't have much else to say about it. They're using it in the right way. They're, they, as far as I can see, in, 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 interception rate is apparently very low. and. I think it, it just shows that we tend to disparage Western technology because because perhaps we we have this. It's a good thing we have ideas going back and forth about what's a good thing and what's a bad thing, and perhaps we think our systems can be a little bit more effective than we give ourselves credit for. The other thing also, is it. Go ahead, sorry, no. Yeah, I said we also have the freedom to critique versus you know we don't hear a critique out of Russia or China for their no. weapon system say so yeah and had we earlier we would have known the t14 was a bust and that the sc57 they could only make less than 20 of them in the time that we made 300 some f35s you know so yeah, yeah. there's a probably the element of that too anyway yeah, go ahead it, yeah it, it, i mean look it's a good system i have absolutely zero doubt it's having a real impact on the battlefield i would like to give credit to the men and women who put months of work into making it work from an su24 I, right. I think there's, there's I, I i am absolutely fascinated to read the book or the the blog posts or whatever comes out after this finishes about how they see some of this integration work because it, because it makes the sort of nerd within me extremely excited but me too, me too yeah so i think i think credit to them and i think credit to the ukrainians for for using it effectively and i think also credit, frankly, to the decision makers on this side of the Atlantic that said, OK, we're going to push the button and we're going to, we're going to move ahead with this. And the way that it was framed, I appreciated it was like they're launching cruise missiles against Ukrainian targets every single, let's not every single day anymore, but you know, every single week. It's not an escalation to give them the same thing. And, and we're not giving them tomahawks. We don't have thousand kilometer range systems there. I mean, right. I think they should have some hooks, if you ask me. But, uh, you know, we, mm -hmm. we're not <clears throat> we're not doing anything special. We're not giving them technology which the Russians would never, ever had eyes on. I mean, this thing has been a primarily export system for 20 years. So, I, I think, yeah, it, it's obviously very, very effective. I think some of this talk about attackers is perhaps premature. We'll, we'll wait and see on that one. But I think that we, ju we just have seen, if you give them the tools, they will use them. Um, right. They use them very well. It, it's, it, it's as simple as that. And, you know, I would like to touch on it at some point. There has been plenty of deficiencies within within the AFU, which I'm, I'm not pointing out, but Ukrainians are pointing out themselves. But on in this particular case, I think the Ukrainian Air Force has been doing a heroic job of a very, very, very difficult situation. And I, I think people perhaps Wunderwaffen is made too much of, but if we do get to the stage where the F-16s are in combat and they are operating, that's going to be another step change in capability. And look, I, I think we should have given them storm shadows a long time ago, but I do appreciate the, the technical and the political restrictions and, and constraints that we have to deal with. But uh, yeah, I, I think the storm shadow has been very, effect very, very effective. I think the Excalibur has been very, very effective. The bonus round one five five, I think. There's very, very, there's very, very few systems which the West has given to the Ukrainians, which they haven't been able to use effectively. But yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I, I was surprised. It seems like they, because I don't know much about the Storm Shadow. I, I know its basic details. I, I was surprised that the 
they don't seem to be doing very well intercepting. The, the interception rate seems really poor, and that, that kind of surprised me. Not that not that it should be easy, but I think that I think we severely overestimated some of the Russian AA capabilities. That seems to be that seems to be a lesson learned from the last year. Not that they're not formidable, but I, I don't know, man. They don't seem to be doing that great altogether, stopping some of our some of the West's most advanced weaponry. Yeah, that, I mean, I, I think I think their G bad organization has have been overestimated, and we know that this stuff can work very well. I mean, the Ukrainians have used nineteen eighties systems to great effect over time, and I think one of the things which Ukrainian Air Force pilots have said is, "No, I'm not an aviation guy, but the danger is not from their ground based air defenses; it's actually from Russian Air Force fighter jets with the R thirty seven. I can't." remember exactly, but with their very long range missiles. And we know there's been more than one kill of Ukrainian Air Force jets using that system. And it frankly boggles my mind that we are so far into this invasion and they are the Ukrainians are still operating, they're still running S port, they're still doing missions, and the Russians are just struggling so hard. And I, I think maybe some of that is to do with the fact that they don't want to lose their assets because we, we saw, I mean, I'm making an assumption here because perhaps I'm wrong, but the Ukrainians moved the Patriot Pack 2 battery fairly close to the border not so long ago. And you had four aircraft down in a day. And I might be wrong, but I'd like to think a Western Air Force would be perhaps cognizant enough of the dangers that they're facing that this could happen, that they wouldn't be doing, they wouldn't be encountering quite such terrible issues. And it's interesting because right. I think that's a problem with how the command structure works. Because when we saw, we can touch on Wagner if you'd like, but we saw the Wagner columns move towards Moscow. They had modern air defense, they had some not so modern air defense. And guess what? They worked extremely effectively. So yep. I don't mostly think it's an equipment restriction limitation. Right. Yeah. I, you made a good point about the uh, kind of going back to our assumptions and expectations when it comes to Ukraine's like, ongoing counteroffensive down south and near Bakhmut. Mm. And where a lot of the, a lot of folks were expecting this to be this rapid desert storm style offensive. And I, I, I having trouble wrapping my head on how anyone could think that because we together, you know, UK and the US and every other ally that we had, we had an astounding overmatch of air superiority over Iraq. And Ukraine doesn't have that. In fact, neither side has air superiority, but they're still launching an offensive against layered defenses, which is the, one of the most difficult tasks, if not the most difficult, besides maybe an amphibious landing that you can do as a military force. And they're making progress. I mean, they are, but like, but the expectations beyond that were way, way too unrealistic. And, and again, so some, yeah. some, some, politicians that belong to a certain wing of a certain party keep bringing that up as a reason to stop stop funding and they, again it's a fundamental misunderstanding of how war actually actually works we were spoiled by our success in desert storm and there's a there's a trap we're falling into where we think every conflict's going to be just like that and the reality is it's not god forbid knock on wood it never happens but if we were in a war with russia right now in some country and we, it would be different. I'm not saying we would, I, I still am very confident in our chances, but it would not be the same at all. It would, yeah. it would be significantly difficult. Yeah. I, I, and it's sort of, that's the kind of mindset that you get from seeing a recruiting ad, which has, you know, hyper masculine guys doing stupid things and, oh, that they're just going to beat us. I, I, it, it's, well, I don't think we have to worry about those people in the, in the, in the, in the sure. sort of genuine analytical sense. It, it's just stupid, low information think, way of thinking. But, yeah, I mean, it, it, is, it, is, it is really interesting, at least to me, that I'm not going to say blame here, but there has Ukrainian messaging before the offensive, to some degree, did allow for this thunder run Kharkiv style blaze through kind of viewpoint and I think there is some evidence to some degree that you know particularly the, the 47th Brigade they, they perhaps expected to do something a bit close a bit closer to that in the, in the first couple of days of the war it didn't work out I'm not criticizing anyone sure. for that at this point so and I'm not I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a strategic analyst so I, I really don't think it's my place to do that but at the same time to anyone that 
is informed unless you are talking in bad faith. This is not this is this is not a failed offensive. They are not used up. There is not thousands of them dying in, in one spot. And we have seen over and over and over the Ukrainians are much better at medical care. They're much better at staying with their men. They are they are much more cognizant of, of human life where they can be. And yep. this doesn't apply universally. But sure. and and and, and uh, I just think it we've got to have nuance here. And I think people kind of see that and go, oh well you're just coping because they didn't they didn't do this or they didn't do that. And it's like, look, in, in three weeks or three to four weeks, they've taken more land than the Russians did in, in six months. Now, you right. can argue about the significance of that land. Sure. And you could say, well, it's less significant. Fine. But you can't then turn around and say this is the world's most terrible failed offensive. Exactly. Because, because, because the, you know, and, and, and you, you touch on a good point that the Russian engineering corps overall they, they, they are good at what they do. They, they're doing, the Soviets were not bad at engineering either, as, as far as my understanding reaches. And they're doing what the Soviets do or did. And the, the trenches are effective. And anyone realistically expecting the kind of sprint through, what, what, what are you smoking? And that includes, right. that, that includes, to be clear, listening to people from the Ukrainian side, from, from, from the AFU, from 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 their intelligence services, from defence ministry, that includes that. You need to be sceptical of all of it and and, sure. and look at what they've got to run into. And I just have I have an awful lot of respect for the men that are running up <coughs> they're running up against that hour after hour, day after day. And I I do think we're going to see a situation where they make more gains. But exactly what that looks like and where that is is a different is a different kettle of fish, as it were. But I think what we can be assured is that the systems which the West have given, or in some cases sold to the Ukrainians to do that, it, it works. It, it, it's effective the great bulk of the time. Uh, there's very very few systems which the Ukrainians are saying, "Oh, this doesn't." And we even sure. had these situations where you've got ex-British army you know, mastiffs or wolfhounds or whatever, essentially my protected vehicles that are meant for rolling through Basra in 2006, performing actually very well against a high-intensity high conflict, against tank shells, against artillery. So I, I think actually we shouldn't be down on ourselves. Well, what I do think we should be down on ourselves for, and I include particularly the UK in this, but a lot of other places, is is bulk. I think one of the things in terms of weaponry is this: the, the levels of, of usage of artillery ammunition and of small arms ammunition and all of these systems is incredibly, incredibly high to anyone that can see it. And the, and the Russians, to be clear, have massive, massive problems in that regard as well. But where is our investment for it? Because maybe the war ends soon. I hope it does. But if there is ever a conflict against China, do you think that somehow they would have less capability than the Russians to produce ammunition? Uh, right. <laughs> like we need to get serious now, and I think a lot. I think a lot of countries are are getting serious. I don't think we are properly. I think there's a lot to be done there. But that's just my opinion. That you know, I don't think you need to be an expert to say they're using so much ammunition. They're using so many missiles, and this is just going to be the case if there's ever ever a huge scale for a huge conflict like this. And we, we saw it in Libya where NATO allies were running out of ammunition, just bombing the, the, the Gaddafi's army. I, I think that should have been a wake up call, but perhaps that's not. Yeah. No, you know how that goes. It takes a lot longer for wake up calls to actually happen. Uh, and it takes a lot of people were to some... die as well, apparently. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. There was some speculation that if, if it was the US and the UK in Ukraine shoes right now, we would have we would have burnt through most of our stocks even faster because we tend to be a little bit more liberal with how we use you know our, our ammunition. But I've seen some moves back in the states at least. I know even here in Pennsylvania they they started back up a this factory that used to produce artillery shells and they started they tried to, they're starting to increase capacity. I don't remember the quote and I don't I don't even recall. I'll have to look it up and maybe I can post it separately when I when I share the episode. But there at least is a narrative that is is there, and it seems like I, the the Pentagon is taking it extremely seriously because I I've, I've seen a lot of communications from a supply perspective about we need to seriously 
we, we need to take a step back and look at our production capabilities, especially for artillery and missiles, because it's going to be a problem if we if we really want to play ball. And like you said, we shouldn't assume that China has any lack. We shouldn't assume that they can't manufacture their own. And we also shouldn't assume that anything that ever happened in the future is going to be quick, because as we've seen, it almost never works out that way. I mean, very few wars are short. You know, again, we're spoiled by Desert Storm. That's a problem. We're spoiled by Iraq in 2003. And because it was an overwhelming success in the early, you know, early months. We just can't operate like that anymore, whether we like yeah. it or not. Yeah. And, I, and look, people, people tend to miss this, but in the first couple of months of the war, there was many things that saved Kiev, but, but one of the most important things was artillery. And, and yeah, modern, you know, drones, drones spotted artillery, but everyone was, I say everyone, but a lot of people were, Dooming about the mysterious convoy, which which never got there. Part of the reason it never got there was because you know they had they've got awful logistics and all of these things. But another reason was like oh, the man. Ukrainians were using an awful lot of munitions to to stop to stop them. Like they they that, that the reason they needed M seven Simpsons or they needed all of these other Western systems in in one five five is because you know the the Soviet stocks were running very very low. And I, I would, I, their, their own production is increasing and European production is increasing and American production is increasing. All of these things are great. And that's what we need. But people do tend to forget that at the very beginning, it wasn't just, it, it wasn't just all the, the Russian planning problems and their assumptions. It was the fact that the Ukrainians did have some stocks of heavy, heavy munitions they could apply liberally uh, for quite a long time. And, and, they they used it effectively, and, and we, we we've seen the result. I think I think one of the things that I think Faust said has he or has said over and over is you know the, the Russian military of two years ago or a year and a half ago simply it's never going to be back in, in any sense. So in that sense, the damage is already done. But there's there's a lot of future threats to think about, and and it is important to consider that uh, hopefully uh, on. Ukraine's weapon, Ukraine, Ukraine weapons tracker. We will be doing more on this soon, but the Russians have stepped up production in, in a big way. They, they have increased production. Their, their artillery production has majorly increased. Their, their anti-tank guided missile production has increased. Their small arms ammunition has increased. So you know, I, I say this as a person that is a non-expert. I don't, I don't think we can complain in, in any way. Right. And I've seen some some images popped up over the last few days of Chinese artillery shells uh, being used by yeah. the Russian forces. So they've obviously, I mean, that's, a no, we knew that was going to happen. I don't know if it's in any significant number. I don't, I don't know, but we can expect that will continue. Again, the best solution right now is for a, my opinion, is an aggressive, violent victory that truly makes the war just unsustainable anymore for you, for Russia. And that, that could still take some time, but I think I think what they're doing, and I think what they're doing is right. I think they they saw that the just going back to the offensive thing. I think they saw that the it was going to be more difficult in that specific area than they were hoping, and that that's fine. That's how that works. They adjusted. It seems now that they're okay with a slower, more cautious pace, which I am too, because again, it saves lives. And they their counter battery for taking out artillery, AA, and even EW systems seems to be. <clears throat> the way that they want to degrade the capability and just continue to weaken the South over time. I think they can't do that because, like you said, you go on the Russian Telegram, it's not good news on their Telegrams. It's it's not. There, there's not a lot of optimism right now, nor should there be, frankly. But <clears throat> even with the... I know you saw... I saw your thing about the Bradley, the, the, the Bradley vehicles getting a little bit of a cult status because, you know, those few were lost in that first push and of course, the the propaganda channels jumped on that as if it was some aberration or it was strange. But very few that I saw these catastrophic Bradley failures. A lot of crew survival in almost every video I've seen, which is great. That's what they're designed for. We have there are thousands of Bradleys out there. If it lets that crew live a little bit longer, and they also tear some people up with the auto cannon in the meantime, that's great. You know, so I I don't want them to do. I wouldn't want them to do human wave tactics like Wagner did in Bachman. You know, I don't that we don't want that. We want them to sustain their fighting power for longer and that's the way to do it. To be a little bit more cautious. It takes time, but you know, it's a trade off. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, I think I think actually 
there are outstanding concerns about how long the support from the West lasts, so I'm not going to touch on sure. that too much. And, and they're legitimate, but at the moment, the Russian leadership, if I put it that way, believes they can withstand this, but at the same and, and outlast it. But at the same time, look at what they thought they could do in February 2022, and right. then look what happened after that. I, I don't think we need to have any. Yeah, I don't think we need to rely on exactly what they're thinking. I do think that people sometimes forget that, you know, they are not operating on the same value system as perhaps in the West we are. And perhaps that the value of the concept of the value of, of lives is is perhaps a very different thing for them. But yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I think I think it, it's going to be a really interesting few weeks and months. And I, I really think this is not the last front for everyone to be worrying about. That, that's just my opinion. We, we've seen enough signals and enough perhaps lack of signals and enough units which aren't in places where you perhaps expect them to be that sure. perhaps there's more coming. Uh, that, that's just my opinion. But when it comes yeah. to the weapon systems, yeah, I think we should just, if anyone says the tank's obsolete, they should be quiet. If anyone thinks that drones are obsolete, they should be quiet. I, I, I think almost we're talking about a story of, of, both a World War One attritional trench warfare and a lot of these modern advancements on top of that are frankly just making the whole process more intense rather than becoming a, a, a huge game changer. You know, we can say that the High Mars was a game changer to the degree that all the logistics were getting disrupted, but we saw an action. And I have no doubt that there'll be adaption to Storm Shadow and there will be adaption to, to all sorts of things. But I, I, I just think it's still going to be, as my opinion, it's going to be grinding. It's going to be brutal, clearly, of uh, uh, utmost respect to the guys that are there. But I don't think, I don't think that the prevailing narrative of, of, of what's happening in one spot in the South is something that we should be listening to. I don't think it's smart, but that's my, that's my take. Sure, yeah. You want to stay a little objective as best you can. You want to just, like you said, watch... Just look at the reality on the ground, you know. Take a take a, a balanced view as best you can, and just don't make a, don't make assumptions. I think making wrong assumptions just puts you in hot water half the time. And uh, you're right. Well, so so yeah, so that, that's kind of what I had for you, question wise. I guess my last parting shot would be: Is there anything that you currently are are working on that you're kind of passionate about, or just anything you want to like last little word you want to bring attention to before we before we wrap up for today? Yeah, well, I'm always trying to be as accurate and interesting as possible with, with the material that I put out there. I hope that that there is going to be some more substantial reporting, if I could put it like that, of, of some of the more uh, of some of the less covered aspects of what's happening in Ukraine. We are hopefully working, so no guarantees at all, working on some writing regarding the reactivation of Ukrainian Air Force equipment during the war and how they are using donated Eastern Bloc pattern aircraft. In that regard, we are working on what we could call the, mobi the mobilization models of uh, Ukrainian armored vehicle refurbishment production, because there has been a lot of that, and people have talked to lots about the new up-armored Russian tanks and slightly less about, about what the Ukrainians are doing. We are trying to learn more about what the Iranians have been producing for, for both sides. It's definitely on both sides. So there's, there's all sorts of really, really interesting things there, but it's just the case, frankly, of finding the time. And but despite what a lot of people think, I, I'm, I'm not paid for almost anything of this. Most things you, well, 99% of what you see in public of anything that I've written is completely free of charge. It's, it's completely paid for by me. And I do it because I want people to to hopefully have accurate information that I can put out there. That that's 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 the goal. So yeah, absolutely. If if you'd like to support what we're doing, there's coffee links on, on my profile, it's right there. But to be honest, you should be donating to the people that are under fire, not to not to me. I am lucky. But I really do hope that in the future I can continue providing relevant information. Yeah, no, that's great, man. Like, again, I, I've been following following your account for a while. I've followed UA Weapons for a while, which is the Ukraine Weapons Tracker. I've been following that for a hot minute now, and a lot of a lot of fantastic information from both. So I, I do appreciate your efforts just to just to get that info out there because it's it's typically 
really, really balanced. It's just here are the facts. It, there's no spin to it. I really appreciate that because I, I try to maintain that as best I can. Now, granted, my account's more a little more of the shit post variety, so sometimes I I don't I don't I do I do some effort posting, but I appreciate you guys. So, just as a quick reminder for anyone who's listening and wants to follow Callie or the UA Weapons page, if for some reason you're not, Callie's page on Twitter is at is Caliber Obscura, and then there's at UA Weapons, and then for the website's CaliberObscura.com or UAWeapons.com. You can check out any of those, and I highly recommend you follow all of them because they're they're really good with that man that's all i had for today i really appreciate the i really appreciate your time this was a really interesting chat so i'm i'm, I'm appreciative of you joining in yeah I, pr- I appreciate it. it's been interesting i would just like to note it's not just me that works on on ua weapons we have yeah you know, there's two of us and we are privileged to try and perhaps not be the most the fastest out there but to try and put out as, as much accurate information as we can including some some sourcing from things you don't just see pulled off telegram there are some unique stuff there so i would encourage people to check that out and i would also encourage people to donate to either either buy stuff from saint javelin donate to come back alive donate to credible ukrainian charities or syrian charities if you can because remember there was earthquakes a few months ago and there's still thousands and thousands of people in idlib who both enjoy Russian artillery and living in terrible conditions. So if you could think about those people rather than me, I'd appreciate that. No, that's great. That's that's really good. And just to throw throw that out there, Armory Bazaar is the yes. at for your partner in the UA weapon. So give yeah. him a follow, him or her a follow as well. I actually, I, I just realized I wasn't, so... I just did that, so I'll make sure. He doesn't I, uh, say much. He's the he's the silent one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there always has to be one, right? A type A and a type B, but that's great, man. Well, again, thank you for joining. I will. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to be circling around with you soon. Maybe we'll talk about something a little bit different. Maybe we can fine tune some new topics. But in the interim, again, your time is greatly appreciated, and we'll be in touch soon. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you very much.